in a series. This webinar is the second in a series of military EMC workshops hosted by MET Laboratories that are designed to develop a complete picture of EMC compliance to military standards as it applies to equipment as well as manufacturers to ruggedize products for consumer markets. MET is a global leader in the testing of electrical and electronic equipment for environmental hardiness, product safety, and electromagnetic compatibility. MET has over 25 years of MILSPEC testing experience and the ability to test to any mission profile with accreditations by A2LA, NAVLAB, ISTA, FAA, and NASA. MET is also accredited for RTCA, DO avionics testing, and Defense Logistics Agency approved to perform testing of fiber optic components. We operate world-class labs in Baltimore, Maryland, Santa Clara and Union City, California, Austin, Texas, and also runs operations in China, Taiwan, and Korea. This webinar will run roughly 45 minutes with an additional time at conclusion for questions and answers. Due to the number of registrants, all attendees will have their phones muted. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of your GoToWebinar control panel. We will attempt to answer all questions at the end. Today's webinar is being presented by John Mason. John is Met's Military EMC Lab Manager. At this point, I will hand the presentation over to John. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about military EMC test methods. Um, our first webinar that we did in the series, we focused on MIL Standard 461 version G, which is the, the newest version of MIL Standard 461. And today's, today's webinar is going to be uh, bringing in test methods from other standards and without any focus on any specific version. Um, the focus will be more on the test methods themselves. So here's an outline of what I plan to cover. I'll talk about the hierarchy of military EMC standards. Uh, I'll get into a, a detailed uh, analysis of, of one example test method, and I chose CE-102 from MIL Standard 461. I'll go over some of the other more common test methods from MIL Standard 461. And I'll talk about ESD, power quality, electromagnetic environment, and then shipboard DC magnetic field testing. So from a hierarchy point of view, MIL standard 464 is actually at the top as the system level standard. And they de define a system as a platform, meaning a military ship, aircraft, ground vehicle, helicopter, etc. Uh, so within MIL standard 464, there are several sections that where within those sections they list that, the, that there are requirements for subsystems, not just the entire platform. So I listed some of those sections here, um, 5.2.3 multi-paction, and there's other sections for induced levels into antenna ports, external RF EME, lightning, electromagnetic pulse, bonding, grounds. And then section 5.7 of MIL standard 464 makes a reference to MIL standard 461 for the control of electromagnetic interference for, of subsystems. And MIL standard 461 contains many individual test methods that, that may be applicable to a subsystem. Um, and when they're talking about a subsystem within MIL standard 461, they define that as something at the electronic enclosure level. So it, it doesn't cover full platforms, um, and it, it also doesn't, go, doesn't cover discrete components or even small modules. It would be more at the electronic enclosure level. And then section 5.7.2 references DOD standard 1399-070 for DC magnetic fields on ships and um, it describes a test that's done at 1600 amps per meter uh, DC susceptibility test. And then th there's a reference in section 5.8.4 of 464 for ESD for subsystems um, and at the end of that section they say testing shall be done to standard, uh, standard such as, and they, and they actually reference AECTP-500 
However, I listed IEC 61000-4-2 here as it's a uh, well-known standard in the EMC testing industry and um, it's very often used to satisfy that section of Mill Standard 464. And then there's also some references to power quality testing within Mill Standard 464 and um, there's three different standards that are used to cover the various platforms. So MIL standard 704 for aircraft, 1275 for ground vehicles, and 1399-300 for ships. So the, the method that I chose to go into a detailed analysis example is uh, CE102. Um, so CE102 is one of the test methods within MIL standard 461 and it's used to verify the emissions that are conducted out of the power input leads of, of the uh, sub subsystem and it's uh, checking for unintentional radio frequency energy that's conducted out of, out of the EUT power input ports. Um, and these, this type of disturbance is caused by spurious outputs and intermodulation products from intentional transmissions or other, other uh, outputs from other incidental emitters. Um, often the, the actual subsystem power supply noise, such as switching power supply noise, will cause emissions that conduct back out of the input port that are uh, exceeding the limits. And the concern with um, that's being addressed is that these disturbances that the uh, unintentional emissions that conduct back out of the power port of a subsystem can make their way into other electronic devices that are connected to the same power system and it can cause interference to those other devices. So this test is done using a measurement receiver or a spectrum analyzer and it's connected to a data recording device, usually a computer that has some control software also to control to uh, automate the testing. And during the calibration of the test equipment system, a signal generator is used to send in a known signal. Um, an attenuator, and they call it specifically a 20 dB attenuator, is used to protect the receiver or the spectrum analyzer input. Um, whenever you connect a spectrum analyzer to the measurement port of a LISN, um, even though that measurement port is uh, isolated from the power line by a, a capacitor, there is some portion of the volt of the actual power voltage that gets through um, for AC power that gets through onto the measurement port. So that's one of the reasons for the protection uh, attenuator. And then also during the calibration process, an oscilloscope is used um, part of that process. And then lizens are used as Lizens are, are a standard part of all the MIL standard 461 setups so that they establish a 50 ohm impedance on the power lines um, and they also allow for that impedance match with the spectrum analyzer or the receiver. So this is the picture of the limit and uh, by the way I, I grabbed most of I grabbed this uh, information from version F Although version G is the newest version, um, the majority of testing that's going on these days is still to version F and um, until new until new military more new military platforms are built to version G, um, version F is you know still where the majority of testing is happening. So this limit you can see that uh, it extends down to 10 kilohertz, which is a little bit unique for conducted emissions for anyone who's familiar with commercial um, conducted emissions limits such as FCC Part 15 or um, CISPR limits, they usually only go down to 150 kilohertz. For the upper portion of the limit that levels off at 60 dB microvolts, um, that's actually the same limit as FCC Class A, I believe, um, from 5 megahertz and up. But the difference is that for MIL standard 461, you need to use a peak detector um, to meet this limit, whereas for uh, CISPR and FCC, you use a quasi-peak and an average limit, two different limits, um, you, and you use a you know, quasi-peak and average detector when you're taking the measurements, which is 
it's a little bit more lenient because any uh, quick emissions um, without a long duty cycle won't register a high reading necessarily on the quasi peak or average detector. So when you're using a peak detector, it's it's more difficult to control all emissions from a designer's point of view to be below these this curve. And as you can see, there's a relaxation to the curve that's allowed for EUTs operating at different voltage levels. So 28 volt DC powered equipment and anything powered at a voltage lower than that has to meet this basic curve. Um, but then other higher voltages have some relaxation of the limit that's allowed per the, uh, the table at the top of the limit. This is a, the diagram of the CE-102 calibration setup from the standard, and, and this means uh, the system level calibration, so not calibration of individual pieces of test equipment. Those are not covered under the standard. This is for the entire test system. You can see that a signal generator is used to send in a signal to the LISN. This port that it connects to the LISN is the port that would normally be where the EUT power comes uh, out from the LISN and connects to the EUT. During the calibration, the power input is turned off and signal generators sent into that port so that we can measure that intentional signal on the actual signal output port that's connected to the measurement receiver. And also, a oscilloscope is connected with a T connector here so that we can tune or calibrate the uh, signals at the 10 and 100 kilohertz sig uh, levels. And that's because the LISN actually doesn't have a flat 50 ohm impedance all the way across its ra uh, range. Below 1 megahertz and down to uh, 10 kilohertz, the impedance actually rolls down. So there's going to be a correction factor for that. And the way that that is accounted for is by tuning the uh, signal level by taking a measurement with an oscilloscope, me measuring the amplitude with an oscilloscope during the process. And then this is a photograph of the same diagram that's showed here. The only thing that's not shown in this diagram is the spectrum analyzer, which is off to the side. But this is the signal generator, so the output here is sent into the LISN. And this is a BNC to banana, uh, dual banana jack connector that allows us to connect the center pin of the coax to the actual LISN power port and then to connect the other, the shield, to the ground of the LISN. Um, and then you can see out of the T connector, one coax is going to the input of the oscilloscope and then the other is coming from the uh, signal generator. And then this red cable is the measurement connected to the measurement port and it's connected to the spectrum analyzer that's out of the view of the photo at the other end. And there's just a close-up of that connection. <clears throat> so this use of this banana to BNC adapter is not described in the standard. That's the solution that, that we use. Um, you could probably also just strip a, strip a coax cable to separate the center conductor from the uh, shield and connect it that way. So during the calibration, you first turn on the measurement equipment and allow it time to stabilize. Um, some uh, spectrum analyzers and receivers have some uh, components in there that need to warm up in order to totally stabilize. So you should leave everything on for about 15 minutes. And then you're going to apply a signal at the various calibration frequencies required in the standard. And the amplitude of that signal that you're sending in is you're, you're going to set the signal generator such that it's 6 dB below the limit and apply it to the power output terminal of the LISM. And at that point, you scan the uh, receiver. You use your test software to scan the receiver for the same frequency range that you're going to do during the test, the full frequency range. And you're going to look at your results and verify that the level you sent in is measured uh, plus or minus, with a tolerance of plus or minus 3 dB from what you intended to inject. Um, you have to make sure in your measurement software that the correction factors are applied for your attenuator and then also for the, um, the impedance roll-off that I talked about that's created by the LISM's 0.2 microfarad uh, coupling capacitor. 
And if you do this, run this calibration and your readings deviate by more than the plus or minus 3 dB, then you have to locate the source of the error and repeat the calibration before you move on to the test. And this calibration process is, is performed every time you do the test for each LISM that you're going to use during the test. This is a plot of the calibration data. And the way that we set up our plot is to have some dotted guidelines. One of them is uh, 6 d or 3 dB higher than what we're shooting for, and one of them is 3 dB lower so that we can easily see that the uh, calibration signals fall within the plus or minus 3 dB tolerance. And then this uh, plot would represent a calibration that, that passed or that was compliant. We could move on with the test. The next step that actually isn't, um, I don't think it's described in the standard other than in the general section of the standard is to do an ambient check. Um, the ambient check, I recommend that it's done for every emissions test, although the standard allows that you don't perform the ambient check so long as the EUT emissions plus the ambient emissions still are below the limit. Um, this diagram just shows a photo of the ambient check where there's a, a load box here that accepts light bulbs. And the process is usually to choose a load that draws the same amount of current that the EUT or the sub subsystem under test will draw. And then you run the test. Um, and make sure that the emissions from a simple resistive load like this are below the limit. If, if you measured emissions from a simple load, resistive load, that are above the limit, that would indicate that there's ambient emissions such as radio stations or emissions from other electronic devices in the area that are making their way into your measurement pad. Um, the, these ambient emissions should be controlled by the chamber filtering if you're using a a chamber or even a power source that has sufficient EMI filtering, and you know that should prevent the ambience. And then the next step is to make sure that your UT is first set up for the basic setup requirements that appear at the beginning of four, uh, MIL standard 461. The basic setups required for all the test methods. So the basic setup shows you the size of the uh, tabletop ground plane the height, um, how the EUT cables need to be arranged at different lengths, and they need to be um, insulated from the ground plane by five centimeters, and you need to have two centimeter separation between cables. And all these different uh, parameters need to be achieved. And then there's specifics for the CE-102 setup that are shown here. So one of the Visions at a time is going to be measured, and this measurement receiver or the spectrum analyzer is going to be connected to that LISN's measurement port. On the other LISN's measurement port that's not currently being used, you would put a 50 ohm terminator. And then the input to the LISN's is going to be fed from the power type needed and the output connect of uh, output power connected to the input power port of the EUT. Um, and then the EUT needs to be powered up and and operating for its normal uh, use. So here's a photograph of the setup showing a radio that was under test here, and then the uh, supports used to insulate the EUT cables from the ground plane. And down here are the LISNs in this red coaxial cable is connecting to the measurement port of one of the LISNs. The other end of that coax cable is connecting to the input of the spectrum analyzer. And also on this card out here, there's a computer down here, and you can see the piece of the monitor up there that has the control software on it for the test. So the CE-102 test procedure that's used to actually sweep through the frequency range and gather the, uh, the data is to uh, start out by turning on the EUT and allowing time for that to stabilize, just like we allowed time for the test equipment to stabilize during the calibration process. Um, you want to let the EUT come up to temperature and, and stabilize since these things can affect the uh, level of emissions that are output. And then you're going to select the appropriate lead for testing. So uh, for, for power lines such as 28-volt uh, DC or single-phase AC, you're going to have two lines to test. And then for three-phase power, you're going to have more than that, um, depending if that type of three-phase includes a neutral or not. You could have three or four lines that you're going to test. 
and then you're going to use the uh, test equipment and the test software to scan the measurement receiver over the applicable frequency range. You have to make sure that your software is set up to use uh, to control the spectrum analyzer to use the required bandwidth settings and the minimum step times and measurement times indicated in Table 2 of MIL Standard 461. And that, that procedure is going to be repeated for each power lead. So this is the uh, Table 2 from MIL Standard 461 that shows different frequency bands and then the resolution bandwidth setting that should be set on the spectrum analyzer for those bands. The next column indicates the dwell time. So the dwell time column is for digital spectrum analyzers um, at each step, which um, corresponds to each point of resolution on the display of the spectrum analyzer. That's the dwell time required at each step. The far right column is if you were using an analog instrument. It tells you the dwell time per, per uh, amount of frequency, either hertz, kilohertz, or so on. So here's a detailed uh, description of how the frequency scanning might be done if you're using a digital uh, instrument like a spectrum analyzer. So the standard says you have to step in one half bandwidth increments. So from this previous chart, in the uh, beginning of the CE-102 test range, which is 10 kilohertz, it says that the resolution bandwidth is 1 kilohertz, so our step size is going to be half of that, which is 500 hertz. Um, so, some, for example, a spectrum analyzer might have, might have 600 points of resolution per display. So if that's the case, then for the first band of testing, which is defined as 10 kilohertz to 150 kilohertz here, that requires a 1 kilohertz bandwidth setting, if we're dwelling at 0.015 seconds dwell time, um, and if, like I said, the half bandwidth is uh, 500 hertz, then starting at 10 kilohertz and adding six, 600, 500 hertz steps uh, will take, uh, take us past the end of the first band. So we'll actually stop short of that and stop at 150 kilohertz for the first band. And because we're doing 0.015, uh, 0 0.015 second dwell times, and there's 600 steps that comes out to, to 9 seconds. So we're going to dwell, it's going to take 9 seconds to scan the first band. And then another example for the second band um, that's defined on table 2 as 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, which requires a 10 kilohertz bandwidth setting and using the same dwell time. In that case, one half bandwidth equals 5 kilohertz. So if we're starting at 150 kilohertz and adding 605 kilohertz steps, that's going to take us out to 3.15 megahertz. And it's going to take, you know, nine seconds dwell time for that span. So it, the test goes on as such, uh, doing the required number of spans to cover each range um, and making sure that the proper dwell times and resolution bandwidth settings are observed and followed. As I mentioned, uh, CE-102 is done with automation. It actually states in the standard that it requires automation. Um, if, if you tried to do the test manual, fully manually, it would take an extremely long amount of time to tune each frequency step and record uh, the values and, a, and then calculate for the correction factors. So software is used to control the test equipment, and it receives the data values from the te test equipment calculates the correction factors, and generates the final data. This is a screenshot of a software that's used here at MET called Tile. It's an ETS Lindgren product, um, which is modified commercial off-the-shelf uh, software that allows you to create profiles to control different EMC tests. So it looks complicated at a glance um, because there's lots of different steps that we program for um, entering project information, running the calibration process, running the ambient process, um, so on and so forth. But it's actually a very user-friendly software. And uh, so what, the question is, what if you are finished doing the test and then you see that your emissions exceed the limit, um, what can you do about that? So one thing that's quick that you can check is to make sure that your EUT is properly grounded. A lot of RF filtering relies on the filter to be 
have a proper uh, platform ground connection in order to have a path for the unwanted uh, currents, RF currents, to flow to. Um, it, and then if you if you verify that and you're still having issues, changes to the RF filtering section of your product is going to be the most common fix. One thing that kind of um, can be a little bit more challenging with meeting this military limit is that most commercial uh, stock filters are only going to provide attenuation down to 150 kilohertz to match up with the commercial limits. Um, so you may have to get a custom filter made that's going to provide any attenuation down to 10 kilohertz if your problem happens to be between 10 kilohertz and 150 kilohertz. This is a typical uh, filter schematic and um, shows that it, and not all filters include all of these components. Um, and some filters include more components or more stages in order to achieve uh, different performance levels. This, this one shows that it has a common mode choke that's shown here in the L1 uh, dotted box. And it's going to be used to suppress the common mode noise. And then it has uh, capacitors to suppress the differential mode noise and uh, different capacitors. So X capacitors for differential and then the Y capacitors are shown for uh, suppressing the common mode noise and the differential mode noise. So that was the, the detailed um, example of the step-by-step, -step, uh, you know, how one of the test methods in the EMC, uh, one of the EMC test methods goes. Now I'm going to go through just a quick description of some of the other common um, mill standard 461 methods. And the reason I chose th these couple of methods is that they, um, they're methods that commonly cause failures. And um, they also are applicable to all or most sub subsystems. So CS114 is one of the conducted susceptibility requirements out of mill standard 461. And the frequency range is 10 kilohertz to 200 megahertz. And this test is used to check to see if the equipment under test is susceptible to coupled RF signals. Um, and as I mentioned, it's applicable to most subsystems. Um, the only subsystems that it's not applicable to are subsystems that don't have any external power, power cables, or any external cables at all, power or I.O. So something that's just a battery-powered device with no external cables, there would be no way to run this test on it. So this test would be not applicable. And the test level is actually given in dB microamps. Um, and that can be a type of unit that's not very familiar to a lot of people. So converted to volts in a 50 ohm system, that could be up to 28 volts RMS. Um, the highest test level of any of the, the curves for the test is actually 109 dB microamps, which would only translate to 14 volts RMS in a 50 ohm system. However, part of the procedure um, only allows you to limit the coupled signal to 6 dB higher than the test level. So once you're allowing something 6 dB higher, you could be coupling up to 28 volts RMS signals onto the uh, EUT cables. And um, it, at the high test levels like that, there are there is a high failure rate um, for these for EUTs undergoing this test. And when you do have failures to this test, uh, prevention or you know, de debug and modification to pass the test usually involves um, working with either installing shields on some cables or um, Working with the power, working with the filtering of the power, or even the fil either uh, putting filtering at I/O pins or, or changing values on uh, coupling decoupling components at I/O pins. This is a photograph of a C uh, CS114 test setup, and um, for this one, I, I didn't have anything where we had permission to show the EUT, so that the, there's just a black box hiding the uh, main part of the EUT there and the company names. But this EUT had an external power supply, uh, AC to DC adapter, so the test is injected to the input of the AC to DC adapter. So this gray probe is the injection probe coming out of the uh, RF amplifier. 
And then this black probe is the monitoring probe that allows us to monitor the level of signal induced onto the power cable. Another very common uh, test method out of mill standard 461 is RE102. Um, and the frequency range for this test is 10 kilohertz to 18 gigahertz. This test checks that unintentional radiated RF emissions are below the applicable limits. And this test is applicable to all subsystems. So even if you had a subsystem that has no external cables, it'll still uh, radiate un unintentional emissions, and it still will be applicable for this test. So some of the limits um, for some platforms and some equipment types are very stringent, and there's a high rate of failure for this test. Just like the CE-102 test that I went through in detail, um, this test and all the emissions tests in Mill Center 461 require use of a peak detector. So when you compare to commercial methods that use an average or a quasi-peak detector, it's more stringent and it's more difficult to control peak emissions to be below these limits. So when you have failures to RE-102, um, redesign typically involves improving the shielding of both cables or chassis, and also working with filtering. Um, external power lines tend to act as antennas to radiate RF uh, energy, and improving the filtering, you can limit the amount that those external cables will radiate energy. So another, the final example test that I give that's a common, another common one from Mill Standard 461 is RS103, radiated susceptibility electric field um, from 2 megahertz to 40 gigahertz. And this test is used to check if the subsystem under test is susceptible to radiated RF electric fields. The 18 to 40 gigahertz range is usually not applicable. Um, in the standard, it states that it's optional, and it's only required if the military uh, procuring activity that's uh, executing the, the contract requires it specifically for that contract. And um, that decision is usually made based on if the subsystem under test has any um, devices or you know components in there that are expected to be susceptible to extremely high frequencies, such as in the 18 to 40 gigahertz range. And this test also is applicable to all subsystems. And 461 includes test levels for RS-103 up to 200 volts per meter. And this is a, another test that has a high rate of failure. It's difficult to design something to pass this test. So uh, it's, you know, it, on the first try, it causes a high rate of failure. And type of um, disturbance can can be prevented from causing susceptibility by working with the shielding of both the external cabling and the uh, chassis as well as filtering at the inputs. Um, oftentimes there there are failures to the same frequencies for RE102 and RS103 and fairly often the same type of design modification will improve the result of both tests. This slide shows a setup, an example setup photograph um, that would be a typical setup photograph of RE-102 or RS-103 because for some frequency ranges they actually use the same antenna and the antenna and the coax cable connecting to it and the lizards are the only test equipment within the chamber. Um, in this particular photo, I, I can tell it was taken from an RS-103 test because you can see the isotropic field probe sensor that's used for RS-103 on the stand. Okay, so uh, another test that um, it is also now a test out of 461 in the latest version G. Um, but it's also always been a requirement with uh, with reference from 464 is ESD, electrostatic discharge. Um, the number and name of the test given in 461G um, is CS118, 
conducted susceptibility personnel borne electrostatic discharge. And this test is, is used to uh, verify if the EUT is susceptible to ESD from personnel. So this is the same type of electrostatic discharge you would, everyone's experienced from uh, their car door or some other large metal object on a cold, dry day. Um, you get a shock. So that type of shock is actually potentially disturbing to electronic equipment. And uh, the, the test is from uh, 461 GCS 118 is based on IEC 61004-2. And as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, 61004-2 is all often used even if 461G is not used. Um, IEC 61004-2 is often used directly to satisfy MIL standard 464, section 584. Um, and this test is applicable to most subsystems. Um, it, it wouldn't be applicable to a subsystem that's never expected to come in contact with personnel during normal use. So something that's, you know, hidden, hidden away deep within a platform and it doesn't, uh, it's not interacted with by personnel, wouldn't receive electrostatic discharge from the personnel. And it, for CS118, um, the test levels are up to 8 kV for contact discharges and 15 kV for air discharges. And it's fairly high levels relative to other um, commercial standards. And, and this test also um, causes a high rate of failure. So when it, throughout the presentation when I'm stating things called a high rate of failure, that's in, uh, that's in my observations over testing hundreds of products, you know, in a PMC facility, these test methods have a higher rate of failure compared to the other test methods. And um, for ESD, if you have a, if you have a failure, you have a subsystem that's not compliant to the test, it malfunctions during the discharge, then um, modifications to design design could could include insulating different uh, portions of the device, uh, routing internal wiring differently, shield improving or changing the shielding of the chassis or the uh, external or internal cables and then also filtering of different pins and different uh, signal lines, both internal and external, could, could uh, have effects or make improvements for ESD performance. This is just a photograph of a very close-up um, of the tip of an ESD generator as it's discharging to a, to a copper wall. Um, the generator, the full generator, if, you, if we could see a zoomed out view, looks kind of like a gun, like a toy gun. It has a handle with a trigger, and then um, it allows for the two different tips to be connected. So this is the contact discharge tip, which is pointed. Um, for the purpose of the photograph, just to see the arc, it's not touching the surface, but when you're doing contact discharge, the tip would actually be placed in contact with the conductive surfaces of the equipment under test and then the discharges would take place, and then the air tip would be a, a rounded tip where the generator is energized prior to bringing the tip in contact with the equipment under test, and the air discharge is used for the non-conductive surfaces to see if the discharge is going to arc through or around any uh, non-conductive materials of the EUT. The next category of testing that uh, is considered to fall within EMC testing is power quality. So the military has three different standards um, that I'll go through. So MIL standard 704 gives requirements for aircraft electrical power for, uh, and they, they use the term utilization equipment. So anything that receives its power with, uh, from the aircraft power system subsystems within the aircraft are applicable uh, to be tested. And along with MIL standard 704, um, there's also handbooks, MIL handbook 704-1 through 8 for different test methods for various power types. So the, they cover 28 volts DC, 115 volts AC, 400 hertz. Um, they also have 
within the 115 AC. Um, they have different handbook for wide frequency, like uh, type of devices that can operate off of a wider frequency range. And there's there's a lot of different types there that could be used on different aircraft. So the test methods cover a range of phenomenon from load, steady state voltage, distortion, ripple, transients, interruptions, uh, phase reversal, and there's and there's more. And then MIL standard 1275 is similar testing only for military uh, vehicle power. Um, and this standard includes test methods for steady state voltage, starting operation, uh, transients, reverse polarity, and also other aspects. And the third is MIL standard 1399-300, which is for shipboard power. So this one gives the requirements for utilization equipment for subsystems being installed on a ship. And it includes uh, also various power types, which they define in the standard and give standard uh, numbers to them, like type 1, type 2. And these different power types cover 115 volts, um, 60 hertz, or 400 hertz, as well as 440 volts AC. Um, and the test methods within MIL standard 1399-300 cover different parameters such as voltage and frequency tolerance, spike, emergency condition, grounding, current waveform, modulation, leakage, insulation, and, and more. This slide shows a photograph of a programmable power supply on the right, and on the left is an oscilloscope plot which would be a typical plot that's captured for something like a um, frequent voltage and frequency tolerance test. And, and these are the main, uh, this is the main type of test equipment. This programmable power supply would be the main test equipment used to perform most of the testing out of those standards. Some of the tests would require other equipment like uh, transient generators and um, some of the other equipment that's used for MIL standard 461 low frequency type testing. And the next um, type of test method I'm going to talk about is referred to within MIL standard 464 as external RF uh, electromagnetic environment. It's actually very similar to what MIL standard 461 uh, provides RS-103 test method for. The difference is that this section of 464 is with the focus on uh, susceptibility to platform radiated RF electric fields. So things that are going to be generated by the platform, such as from powerful uh, you know, radar transmitters and things like that. Uh, table 1 through 6 within MIL standard 464 shows different platform levels. And some of these levels include, um, include radiated voltages, voltages up to 27,460 volts per meter. And uh, there's a high rate of failure that's um, experienced in the lab when we when we test for these type of high levels. One thing to note is that um, that extreme level is a pulsed field, so it doesn't have a, a long duty cycle. There's not a lot of uh, continuous energy there at all. But the you know the hot the voltage during that quick pulse is very high. And 464 RS103 uh, using the reverb method is, is what's often used to test for this type of, um, to, to perform this type of testing for this requirement. I've also heard that sometimes testing is done on military bases with the actual radar equipment. So this is a picture of the uh, reverb chamber that we have at our Santa Clara facility. And this chamber can be used to perform the um, EME testing for 464 and other similar standards. Um, there's also extreme levels in RTCA D0160 for commercial aircraft equipment that can be performed with this chamber and this method. And this method is um, interesting and in when compared to the RS-103 method that I showed a picture of where you use a antenna pointed directly at the EUT within an anechoic chamber. 
Um, with the anechoic method I showed prior, the energy um, that you're that you're trying to achieve for the test has to come directly out of the antenna. And the absorbers are carn and iron impregnated uh, foam absorbers on the walls are actually reducing the reflections so that your only um, radiation of interest is directly from the antenna. With the reverb method, it's the opposite uh, concept where the reflections are actually taken advantage of. And this stirrer that you see suspended between the two walls has a motor that can turn it. And it changes the. Uh, standing waves so that you have different hot, hot nodes where the signals, the reflected signals arrive in phase and add together at different points in the chamber. You basically are moving those hot points around the chamber by turning the panel so that eventually you illuminate every point on the EUT with the extremely high level. And the final test method that I'm going to talk about um, today is shipboard DC magnetic field. So this is another another test method that um, has its own standard that just covers this one test method, which is DOD standard 1399-070. And this standard is um, describing a test used to test the susceptibility of subsystems to DC magnetic fields that are generated um, by the ship. So this test can be done with a single or a dual coil. Dual coil uh, configuration is referred to as a Helmholtz coil. And the test level is 1,600 amps per meter DC. The test is performed um, by placing the EUT in three, or three different orientations relative to the DC field. And then the field um, is generated in both positive and negative polarity at each uh, of the three orientations. So this slide shows a photograph of the Helmholtz coil we have here at MET. Um, we use an overhead crane to position and hold the, the coils in place. And a, uh, we use a Gauss meter and place that in the center of the coils. And we energize the coils with a large DC power supply and increase the amplitude of the power supply until we see the 1,600 amps per meter field indicated by the Gauss meter. And that's the calibration of the field. At that point, the uh, Gauss meter is removed and the equipment under test, the subsystem under test, is placed in the volume of the coils and it's subjected to the magnetic field. And then to achieve the different um, EUT orientations, the EUT is rotated left to right 90 degrees to get the second orientation. And then either if the EUT is rotated from top to bottom 90 degrees to get the third orientation or we have to bring the coils down and reposition those so that they are uh, perpendicular to the floor rather than parallel to the floor. And then we would have to recalibrate for that third orientation. So that's, uh, that's it for the presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions you'd like to uh, send in the, in the chat, then uh, we could go over those. And also, if anyone comes up with any questions later and they'd like to, um, they'd like to email those, uh, you can email them to the info at metlabs.com address that's shown on the bottom of the presentation. So we're not able to uh, accept any audio comments, but if, like I mentioned, if anyone wanted to send any uh, questions using the chat feature of the webin of uh, GoToMeeting, then uh, GoToWebinar, then I could ex I could answer those questions.
All right. Well, thanks for tuning in for the webinar, and um, that concludes that concludes the webinar for today. Have a nice day.